Hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us in person or online. Um, today, we are very happy to have Nadia Tomska uh, here giving the CETA seminar. Uh, Nadia is a professor of astrophysics at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, she received her PhD from Princeton in 2005, went on to postdocs at the Institute for Advanced Study in Stanford before moving to Johns Hopkins in 2011. Uh, she's an expert on a long list of topics in galactic and extragalactic astrophysics, including galactic winds from supermassive black holes, quasars, uh, stellar evolution leading to the production of compact objects, white dwarfs, which she'll tell us about today. Um, she's been awarded Alfred Sloan Fellowship, Newton Lacey Pierce Prize, Scilog Fellowship for all this great work. And uh, she and her group are hard at work harnessing data from LSST, SDSS, Gaia, and all the latest circles. Um, so we're very happy to have Nadia here, and she's going to tell us about the astrophysics of white dwarfs with modern surveys. Nadia, please take it away. Thank you. Do you want me to keep the mask on or off? Okay. Um, okay, so um, I am here talking about a topic that's a little bit unusual for me. So my group situation kind of looks like this right now. Um, on the uh, this completely bifurcated or what's it a bipolar personality disorder kind of situation. Um, so I have spent a very significant fraction of my life um, thinking about topics in extragalactic astrophysics, in galaxy formation, um, uh, and quasar feedback. I'm still very excited about all of those topics. I'm very happy to um, talk to you about this. A lot of my brain cycles have been spent thinking about JWST. Um, this is a really accurate illustration of how I feel about JWST right now. I have. Sorry. Oh. Um, Online, please. Can you uh, can you mute your microphone, Sri? We are hearing some other uh, talking there. Um, I have uh, five approved programs for JWST with the first data coming in as early as July uh, for some of our extragalactic stuff. And I've been literally losing sleep over, uh, over some aspects of this, but I'm happy to share um, offline. Uh, but in the last uh, couple of years, I've grown increasingly interested in various aspects of galactic astrophysics. Um, in stellar evolution and in um, young stellar objects and in planet formation. And this is work done in collaboration with actually a very sizable group of mostly undergraduate students with one exception, um, Shanti Huang, who was my thesis student, who is now a postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study. Um, so we wrote a bunch of papers on various topics in galactic astrophysics. Um, and in particular, I want to advertise uh, Shanti Huang's work. Um, he has worked on um, some very, very interesting stuff uh, related to stellar binaries and how they behave in the galaxy and how they evolve. And this is work done with Gaia data. And so I think you should invite him to come out and give a talk here because he has really interesting new techniques for doing these things. Um, but today I'm actually going to be talking about something else. Um, so this is a uh, Today's talk is based on these five papers. Um, uh, and this was work done in collaboration with Shanti and with Vedan Chandra, who was my undergrad, but is now a grad student at um, Harvard. So um, this is all exclusively related to white dwarfs and uh, white dwarf binaries. And um, this is what I wanna tell you about. So I, um, uh, I'm gonna tell you what are some of the interesting topics that um, are just, grab my interest personally and are keeping me interested. And I'm going to try to explain to you why this is now a super exciting time to be thinking about these topics. It's actually a unique time in my life in terms of the flood of data coming in within the last six months and then the upcoming year or two. It's completely unprecedented. I've never been in this situation. It's, it's quite overwhelming. Um, and so then I will tell you a little bit about the adventures of, of the last two years with this, uh, with Shanti and Vedant as we started exploring this topic, um, how to measure white dwarf spectra, how to measure the white dwarf equation of state, and then uh, focus a little bit more on the search for uh, uh, type 1a progenitors and white dwarf, white dwarf binaries. Um, this is something I'm working on right now, but I'm not going to have time probably to talk about it today, but ask me later if you if you're interested. 
Um, so this is an illustration of a supernova remnant from uh, supernova, type, uh, supernova 1572. Uh, this was a type 1a supernova as determined by the chemical composition of the ejecta. Type 1a's, as we will see in a moment, are a very um, a fundamental importance in astrophysics. It's been a long-standing problem of uh, what, what is exploding and under what circumstances. And so um, it's just an illustration of a remnant uh, with uh, no surviving donor that anybody has been able to find. So um, uh, there's a continued controversy as to exactly uh, what has exploded, but it's very likely that this was a, a white dwarf, white dwarf merger. Um, all right. So, um, some of the things that have grabbed my interest for a long time that this presentation is related to involve binaries, ultra compact binaries of compact remnants. Um, and as you all know, uh, ultra compact binaries have seen their share of fame. There are at least three related Nobel Prizes. Um, in 1993, uh, Nobel Prize was awarded to Hulse and Taylor for the discovery of the binary pulsar. Um, whose orbit is shrinking due to the emission of gravitational waves. That was the first indirect evidence for the emission of gravitational waves in exquisite agreement with um, general relativity. Um, accelerated expansion of the universe was discovered using type 1a supernovae. Seems uh, seemed <laughs> not relevant to ultra compact binaries for a while, but uh, it is looking more and more likely that uh, type 1a supernovae are uh, mergers of um, binary white dwarfs. And then, of course, most, most recently, um, LIGO events are um, gravitational waves, um, gravitational wave events from binary black hole mergers and neutron star mergers. What do all of those things um, have in common? They have in common this word ultra compact, which I'm actually mentioning in a very particular sense. So during the emission of gravitational waves um, in the linear regime, so before the final coalescence, when things go nonlinear and then you have to have numerical simulations, um, before this stage, um, the power loss of the binary follows this equation that we know from our GR, GR courses. And so, um, you can invert this equation to calculate the time for the binary to decay to semi-major axis of zero, starting from some semi-major axis. And if you want for this binary to coalesce within some reasonable time, um, something like one giga year, you will actually find that for all of these examples of ultra compact binaries that I have given you above, um, the initial semi-major axis that will merge in the Hubble time is physically smaller than the sizes of the stars before they be became remnants. So here we have immediately a major astrophysical puzzle, which is that most or all of the ultra compact binaries of remnants of interest for all of these problems that I mentioned must have gone through something called a common envelope phase. So and what this means is that the binaries at their main sequence, main sequence stage were separated by distances that are too large for them to merge by gravitational waves in any reasonable time. Uh, when the more massive object started evolving, evolving, it literally engulfed the less massive object. Then there are various cartoonish scenarios of what might happen, but one of the possibility, depending on exactly the stage of the evolution here is that the envelope can get ejected and then the binary is left on this ultra compact uh, orbit. So that's the sense in which I'm using the word ultra compact. This is a very hot topic, common envelope. This is a citation, uh, citation record on ADS for the expression common envelope. You can see uh, uh, people are getting more and more interested in this. This is a major ingredient in every stellar binary evolution model, including those used for LIGO events. Uh, what's fascinating to me is that there's exactly one binary's entrance uh, that has been mapped uh, before, sort of during and after in our own galaxy. There's only one event that was observed before the binary coalesced, and this is the C1309 Scorpius object. This may not even be a common envelope event. For all we know, it could have been a stellar merger. It is a binary that... Um, shrink during an odd stage, a uh, stage, subgiant stage of its evolution. So we don't actually exactly know what's going to happen to this object. 
uh, when it's all done and <laughs> done and dusted. Um, so the common envelope is a uh, phase of stellar evolution remains a bit of a black box in terms of uh, all stellar evolution models. It's a very interesting puzzle. We are also very interested in this from observational standpoint in our group. We're looking for progenitors of these objects using various methods, but I'm not going to talk about that. Um, the second puzzle I've already mentioned is what are the progenitors of type 1a supernovae? Okay, so to remind everybody, um, type 1a's are not standard candles, they're standardizable candles. Um, they seem to have a very well-behaved family of light curve. Um, the fainter ones tend to be shorter, and so there's a phenomenological model that allows you to, you know, use the duration to correct for this effect and then estimate what the intrinsic um, luminosity of this object should be. So that's the calibrated Phillips relationship. Um, for the longest time, uh, so, so there's always been two sort of hypothesized channels, either a binary of white dwarfs or one white dwarf with a main sequence companion. For the longest time, the single degenerate scenario, so white dwarf plus main sequence star was the leading one, but in recent years, it's been clearer and clearer that the white dwarf plus white dwarf um, mergers may dominate type 1As. So I am completely agnostic about this. As you saw, I'm completely new to this field, but I asked the supernova expert Ben Chappi to tell me what, if he could bet on what is the fraction of uh, type 1As that come from single or double degenerate scenario. And he said that he was gonna bet his car that 90% are from double degenerate and 10% from single degenerate. And he thought about it and he said, I have to warn you, it's a really crappy old car. So this is, <laughs> this is the confidence on that statement. That's where we are at. Um, but you know, that's what the experts say. Um, so all of these objects, uh, you know, this double, uh, this double white dwarfs would have to have gone through common envelope phase, perhaps even twice. Um, but before they, you know, before they merge and become type 1As through processes I will discuss, um, they should be observable as white dwarf, white dwarf binaries. And so that's sort of the bulk of my talk is um, the description of how we sort of got on this path um, and what we have found so far um, to search for these binaries. Um, okay, one more thing I want to say uh, before I dive in is, again, if you invert this calculation and ask what kind of orbital periods uh, would shrink uh, uh, in what kind of times um, due to gravitational wave emission, then what you will find is that, so for a one uh, plus one solar mass binary, uh, it's about 10 hour initial orbital period that can shrink in Hubble time. And then in one giga year, it's about five hours or something. So that's a number I want you to keep in mind. Several hour periods for these binaries are the relevant periods for what will, what will merge relatively easily uh, uh, on relevant time scales. So those are, if we want to find progenitors of type 1As, we're looking for objects kind of in this regime. <clears throat> um, what else is happening uh, data-wise in the last several years? Um, this is really an incredible time for galactic and stellar astrophysics. Um, Gaia has already revolutionized the field thanks to uh, very accurate distances to stars. Uh, we have been taking advantage of the photometric uh, variability surveys, both uh, on the ground and in space. Um, the precision and the number of these light curves is just absolutely unbelievable <clears throat> and a bit overwhelming. I will mention some results from um, these surveys. And of course, there's also large scale galactic spectroscopic surveys. LAMAS already has 10 million stars and Sloan 5 will collect several million stars including 80,000 um, uh, spectra of white dwarfs. And for Sloan 5, there is a time dependent component. So there is some um, time resolved spectroscopy as I will say in a moment. Um, so 
flown in terms of coverage, just to compare with uh, what happened several years ago with Apogee, that's uh, you know, the top view of our galaxy, that's the bulge, that's the location of the sun, and that's the depth of the Apogee. And this is what Sloan 5 is proposing to do um, in terms of the coverage of the galaxy. So it's really quite um, dramatic improvement. All right, so how do we find binaries? Um, if we have an ordinary stellar binary, you know, this is one of the most standard things you can do. Use the, you know, if the, if the stars have absorption lines in their photospheres and they, um, their orbital time periods are comparable to the time scales of your observations, that's what you see in the spectrum. I mean, this is obviously cartoonish, but this is actually very similar to the parameters of some systems that I analyzed for, you know, for normal main sequence, main sequence. Um, double line binaries. So can Sloan do the same thing for uh, white dwarf? Um, so um, uh, Sloan will be um, where we are with Sloan. Sloan started taking data in November 2020. Um, it operated for nine months um, with the plates. Then it was shut down to upgrade to the robotic fiber positioning system, and it has been commissioning since January. So we are obtaining um, data again. And so the results I'm going to be showing you are mostly based on this first first year survey, essentially it's sort of still plate survey, but the plates are gone. Um, targeting for spectroscopy is based on Gaia and multi-wavelength data including 80,000 uh, white dwarfs. This is actually lower than the initial estimate. So my heart is a little bit broken about this because we were supposed to get 200,000. And this is not as many because they prioritized variable quasars over white dwarfs. I mean, why would you ever do that? Anyway, said the person who worked on quasars for 20 years. Um, but anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I have to wait and I have professionally DHD, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, so we will have, uh, okay, so for comparison, this is four times more than the total number of white dwarf spectra ever collected by anybody, right? So this is good. 80,000 80, is pretty good. 200,000 would have been an order of magnitude increase, but you know, this is pretty good. Um, it is relatively low resolution spectroscopy, uh, uh, but you know, for these types of velocities in principle, this should be doable. Spectra are taken in 15 minute chunks. Um, and so if your orbit is, you know, an hour to a few hours, you have reasonable um, sensitivity to uh, radial velocity variations. Okay, so in principle, it sounds like all of this is possible. So if we have, uh, you know, relatively massive white dwarf binaries or white dwarf neutron star binaries or white dwarf black hole binaries all sound really exciting. Um, and white dwarfs have absorption lines in the upper layers of the air atmosphere. So in principle, we should be able to use Doppler effect. Um, there is a big problem with white dwarfs, which is that their absorption lines are much broader than the absorption lines of normal stars. And that is because in white dwarf atmospheres, the hydrogen atoms are surrounded by uh, various ionized particles that are messing up the quantum mechanical levels of the transition. And so the transition becomes much broader. So you get the Stark effect. So in principle, this is great because we can measure the physical properties of the white dwarf, such as its uh, gr surface gravity and temperature from the exact modeling of these absorption lines. But um, there are two problems. First of all, uh, the, um, because the lines are so broad, the double line binary starts looking more and more like this. And then you add a little bit of noise and it's completely ridiculous, right? So this is problem number one. And problem number two, in order to actually model this object, you need to use photospheric models for white dwarfs. And as we quickly discovered when we started working on these, all these models are proprietary. There are two, three groups in the world who are working on this. They're doing incredible stuff. It's very, very sophisticated physics. Uh, including convection effects and non-equilibrium uh, non effects and opacity effects and who knows what, but all these models are proprietary. 
And so it was a bit disappointing and a little bit scary to enter this field and we couldn't figure out what to do. Well, that's so what happens when you combine desire to do something with some incredible skills in applied math. Um, so that was my undergraduate student who was a double major in physics and applied math. And he came in, he just solved this problem. Okay, so he wrote this paper, Computational Tools for the Spectroscopic Analysis of White Dwarfs. It's a publicly available piece of code. And so what basically this is doing is he takes the publicly available grids of uh, uh, atmosphere, atmospheric models. They're sparse, these models, and you cannot just use them to fit something because, you know, they are separated in, you know, half a dex and log uh, gravity or whatever. But, you know, using neural networks, he can uh, basically train a machine learning algorithm to uh, predict what the atmospheric model should look like for any label, temperature and gravity. And so it's basically a very clever method to interpolate this original sparse uh, public uh, grid of model atmospheres to a grid of arbitrary precision. And so uh, this paper is on photospheric modeling, usually include plots like this. So this is Balmer series, um, HL phase beta is gamma, blah, blah, blah. And so um, there's a data jagged line and there's a smooth line that's the model. And these are the people who actually know the physics and you see that they produce these beautiful uh, fits and they measure the temperature and they measure the surface gravity. And this is a different white dwarf now from our paper. We don't know any physics. Okay, fine, we know some physics. We've read these papers, right? But the code doesn't know any physics, right? The code just interpolates. And then once it is trained and once it can generate a spectroscopic model for any temperature and gravity, you just do your ordinary chi-square fitting and it just does this extremely fast. Um, but we also produce excellent uh, fits to the data and we can also derive temperature and gravity. So uh, what are the pros? Um, this is very fast. Once the models are trained, this is orders of magnitude faster than these physically motivated ab initio models where they have to generate model atmospheres from their initial parameters. Um, it's public. Uh, we recover parameters with the same quality as those with, uh, with previous models. You give it some new models, we will do more. Um, the cons are that this is completely limited by the publicly released models. And so the models that are publicly released are at least 10 years old by now. Uh, the ones that are newer are proprietary. And the public uh, grid, publicly released grid is limited. So for example, they don't go to super low masses and things like that. Um, so we are in communication with these groups who are holding these proprietary codes to hope to find some um, acceptable solution, but this is definitely a limitation and it's a known limitation of working in this field. Uh, what else do we have? We also have Gaia photometry. Um, just very quickly, so of course the, the sequence and colors is the sequence and temperature, so those are hot, those are cool, um, and then uh, so there are some atmospheric opacity effects here in the observed color magnitude diagram, but if we focus just on the hydrogen atmosphere ones, um, then uh, on just the hydrogen atmosphere ones, this, um, the sequence in this direction is the sequence of mass, and remember that white dwarfs have this inverted mass radius relationship. So they get smaller uh, when they get more massive. And so they get fainter. So this is going from here to here is the sequence and in increasing mass. And this is just the unrelated simulation of where they go, at, where the mass of, how the mass of white dwarfs evolve um, as they cool. Okay, so these are the kinds of data that we have. And so I'm gonna describe adventure number two, um, measuring the white dwarf equation of state. So. Um, stars move with random velocities relative to us. Now we, uh, we, can, me we can, you know, finally measure the properties of white dwarfs using these tools I just described. We can measure their radial velocities from the centroid of the absorption lines. We start plotting everything versus everything, and we plot this plot. Um, on the y-axis, this is the apparent radial velocity. On the x-axis, this is some measure of the white dwarf radius or white dwarf mass. They look similar. So one thing to notice here is that this is the zero line 
and the points are noticeably offset to the red of the zero line. So, you know, a model in which the white dwarfs are expanding around us is not a tenable model. And so we interpret this as the redshift um, with which the photons, uh, that the photons acquire as they climb out of the surface of the white dwarf. Okay, so now we have this tantalizing detection of redshift, except it's messed up by the random motions of stars around us. Um, so what we do is we carefully remove any bulk motions in the galaxy and we average out in bins of mass. And um, the redshift is proportional to the mass and inversely proportional to the radius. So it is a probe of the white dwarf equation of state. Um, so actually we measure, we can measure three things um, that are relatively independent. We can measure gravitational redshift from the spectrum. We can measure surface gravity from atmospheric models and we can measure the radius from the total flux. Um, whereas we want two things, mass and radius. So there's a lot of self-consistency checks that can be done and we do all of them. Um, and so that results us in being able to measure the empirical mass radius relationship across all masses. That was the first such measurement um, that we did with free Sloan 5 data. So uh, what's plotted here is just the value of the gravitational redshift. So for the more compact, more massive objects, the gravitational redshift is very high from the surface of the stars. And this is sort of our final measurement as a function of mass. Um, this is the spectroscopic radius. And again, um, the colored lines are the theoretical models at two different temperatures. And uh, the, the coolest ones are basically just support the, the white dwarfs exclusively supported by the electron degeneracy pressure. Whereas for the hotter ones, um, there's a little bit of thermal pressure components. So they're a little fluffier. And so the Sloan 5 data uh, was not sufficient to measure the difference uh, due to temperatures, but we're just plotting both, um, both models here to illustrate where we are relative to um, the model atmospheres. And then there is an additional several points here that come from other studies uh, where they knew the net radial velocity of the system from the motion of the companion main sequence star. So that's an alternative way of getting to the surface gravity of the white dwarf itself. Um, so of course, this was predicted 100 years ago. So it's very much expected, but still very cute. Um, what we're working on right now are the deviations from the sort of basic Chandrasekhar model. And the two um, deviations that are very interesting are this dependence on temperature. It has not yet been measured. People have tried. I am pretty sure with very high confidence level that we're gonna be able to do this in SDSS-5. Um, and then another very interesting thing potentially is to measure the differences due to composition. So this is a problem in uh, stellar evolution modeling exactly when the, at what masses the white dwarfs stop being carbon oxygen and become oxygen neon um, and exactly what the initial final mass relationship is for very massive stars. Um, unfortunately, it's a very difficult measurement because the only difference from, from the chemical composition comes in the like mean molecular weight of the, of the gas because it, it's all electron degeneracy pressure. So it's a very, very subtle difference. Um, so I'm showing you here a zoom in at this very massive end. Um, these are the carbon oxygen and these are the oxygen mean uh, uh, composition. So it's gonna be hard, but we're trying, okay. Uh, that I cannot guarantee. The temperature, we're gonna, we're gonna get that. Um, but um, the, the composition is very, very hard. Um, okay, so now let me tell you about our search for white dwarf, white dwarf binaries, which was what initially motivated us. Um, so we can look for single line binaries. If one white dwarf is much lower in mass than the other one, the other one is uh, much more compact and much fainter. So you see a single line object, less massive one doing that. Um, if they are relatively similar masses, then you should be able to see a double-lined object doing that. Um, there are also additional statistical methods for uh, looking for these objects that we're exploring. But let's uh, let's take a look at this object. So this is a white dwarf with a spectrum 
These are 15 minute exposures over one hour. The line shapes are changing, but who knows, right? Like, is that the, you know, is it the thing or is it not the thing, right? Like, is it double line binary or is it a single lined object with poor observations? So for this particular object, we did follow-up observations with Gemini and lo and behold, this is a real uh, double line spectroscopic binary. So we did five minute exposures with Gemini. What's being plotted here, this is the spectrum and velocity space observed with Gemini. Every line here is a Gemini spectrum. Um, this is the exposure number. These are the gaps and the sequence of data, but the yellow is where the absorption is. And so you're seeing this S shape signature going as a function of time. The time runs this way. Um, so that's your double lined binary. Okay, this is an absolutely ridiculously beautiful object because we can constrain everything. Uh, we have the, uh, so normally with mass, normally from data like this for um, double lined, double lined um, binaries, um, there is still a degeneracy between the mass and the inclination. But here we can constrain everything because we have photospheric fits for each individual, for, for the combination of two stars. We have to put in the red gravitational redshifts for uh, each one of the stars. And so we can even measure inclination to some ridiculous accuracy. So the orbital solution is fully constrained. Um, so this was the first uh, science paper from the Sloan Digital 5 survey period. Um, okay. Um, so I want to now sort of take a step back and um, remind us what, why it's interesting and whether it's interesting. Um, so we, are, we now have a couple dozen interesting candidates that we're following up. Uh, and um, this is our 99-minute uh, binary that I just showed you. Uh, these are somebody else's points. Um, and I um, want to remind you that for Sloan 5, the sweet spot for periods is a very interesting period range because again, these are, so, so we are sensitive to periods of a few hours because of the cadence of SDSS 5. And these are also the binaries that will merge within the Hubble time. Um, so I want to take a step back and um, discuss what else we're expecting what are the other sources on this diagram and uh, why they're interesting? Yes. Yes. How do you make a white dwarf at that low of a mass? Uh, this is a product of binaries of binary stellar evolution. So there was a mass transfer phase and stuff got thrown off. And most of these objects, so I will actually get to the uh, very briefly to the models that people uh, work out for these objects, um, but they're in all likelihood two common envelope ejections involved. And so, um, yes, you're completely right. You cannot get below 0.4 with single stellar. Um, let me tell you about these ridiculous sources. So this is from Burge et al. This is not from us. These are very short period binaries. And remember that the shrinking is accelerated, right? The closer you get, the faster you shrink. They should be very rare. And so in order to find these objects, you have to probe a much bigger volume in the galaxy. So these objects are distant. Um, they are at one to two kiloparsec. They're selected from about 10 million ZTF light curves. Um, then they have a pre-selection. They identify 25,000 objects that are likely to be periodic. Then they look at all 25,000, which is my favorite thing to do, reminds me greatly of my grad school years. Um, and then they uh, select uh, 300 or so candidates for a follow-up spectroscopy. And so this is this uh, award-winning six-minute white dwarf, white dwarf binary that is this like super beautiful light curve where we see eclipses, both primary and the secondary and the ellipsoidal modulation and the gravitational wave decay. I mean, this is just a, an object that has everything. Uh, and this is from, I think Kevin is his first name, uh, Kevin Burge's webpage, just showing um, how this light curve is produced uh, using different views of this binary, you know, illustrating the magnitude of the ellipsoidal modulation and, and things like, and they have the radial velocities for them too. Um, so, uh, so this is, you know, this is the ZTF bit. Um, 
uh, very, very remarkable, and they're continuing to produce some extremely interesting objects. Um, I have never met Birch, but, it, but there are some really, really beautiful papers. Okay, these wide binary, wider binaries are from pre-SDSS5 targeted spectroscopic surveys. Um, they are, uh, so, so Napiwatsky et al. had a, a dedicated high resolution spectroscopic survey called SPY, and then Brown et al. These ones are mostly from Brown et al. Uh, what they did was they specifically targeted low, ma white, uh, low mass white dwarfs because they knew that these objects could not have been products of single stellar evolution. So the first thing they did was they did confirm that 100% of them are in binaries. Um, and then they, um, uh, they put them all in this diagram. So they actually have a lot more sources. They have 60, 80. Um, these ones are plotted in this diagram because both masses are well determined. Um, basically the same problem that we have resolved in our binary using all this variety of additional observables. So in most cases, they cannot, they only measure the mass function. So they can only place the lower limit on the companion mass. But if you see the companion, then you can do more. Um, okay, um, so there is a very interesting distribution of these objects in the mass period space. Um, so these are periods and days now. So this is my magic 10 hour period. Um, and this is the mass of the binary, but you can see that there's some bimodality going on here. And that is uh, now relatively well reproduced by these uh, binary population synthesis model models. This is a theoretical paper by Lee et al. And um, the, um, the cartoonish sort of paradigm here is that you know, it all starts with one common envelope ejection, but then depending on the exact masses of the systems and on the exact separations, things can go one, one or the other way, and that produces this bimodality. Uh, these models are getting quite sophisticated in terms of, you know, being able to reproduce some of the interesting observables. On the other hand, you know that a theory is in, only in its beginnings when it's described by its alpha parameter, right? So this is all that they can get in terms of parametrizing the common envelope. Uh, evolution is this coupling efficiency between the binding energy released in, during the evolution of the binary and the ejection of the envelope. Um, but nonetheless, this is a physical constraint and that's interesting, right? Because models with other alphas actually look bad. Um, so um, what this tells me is that these stellar binary population models are getting something right. And what they're all unambiguously predicting is that there should be a population of higher mass objects that we have not found yet. And so some of the people working in the field are having very strong words about this. So Kilich et al, where the, the models predict more massive binaries that are still waiting to be discovered in large numbers. Um, this is the plot that I was just allowed to show by SDSS5 director. Um, this is where we're going, right? We have published one binary, but we have, you know, a couple of dozen candidates. And I do hope that for the first time, we will actually have a probe of the mass distribution of these binaries, which will be very valuable. And we do have um, hypothetical high mass objects. I'm not going to say anymore. But anyway, so this is, uh, this is exciting. Um, all right, what happens when they shrink? And this to me is absolutely kind of like the fascinating bit that I just, like I said, I'm new to this field and that, that part blew my mind away. Um, so there are several possible scenarios for what happens when they have shrunk. One possibility is that they merge and produce a massive white dwarf. Lots of interesting phenomenology here, lots of controversy, lots of disagreement. Um, some people believe that essentially 100% of massive white dwarfs about one solar mass are merger products. Other people say it's much less than that. So that's where we are, you know, 10 to 100% are the current estimates, but you know, that's, that's where the field is. Um, there are really exciting possible signatures to look for. So high mass, high rotation rate inherited from the orbital angular momentum high magnetic field, high kinematic ages. Okay, one possibility. The second possibility is that they merge, produce a super Chandrasekhar white dwarf 
which then loses whatever additional magnetic rotational other support thermal support it has and it collapses or explodes nobody knows there's one source very weird very iffy nobody knows what it is but these authors hypothesize that this is it and their models being developed by Elliot Quartert and, and his group okay um, then there is a third possibility and that is very exciting um, that um, uh, they explode in uh, at the sub Chandrasekhar regime so and that's what I want to tell you about so um, I had never heard of this until I started working on this and yet when I attended a white dwarf um, a, a conference a remote conference a year ago this was the single scenario the one and only scenario described for the origin of type 1a supernova so um this is a simulation from uh boost towns Lation, and collaborators um that basically successfully explodes in 0.9 or one solar mass um co core plus helium shell white dwarf the um key sort of piece here is that the Something, there's a little piece of magic here, but only a small one. Something detonates this helium shell. The shock wave starts propagating. Then the shock waves kind of go around and uh, collide and become strong enough to sort of penetrate the CO core. And then the, uh, that ignites the explosion in the CO core itself. Um, so um, this is the so-called double detonation model by Shantown, Flebus, and e even um, uh, earlier folks. So this is actually remarkable um, in terms of how good these models are getting at matching observations. I showed you this plot before, Phillips relation. This is another way to demonstrate Phillips relation. This is the drop of magnitude over 15 days. So these are fainter, uh, fainter, shorter ones, and these are brighter, longer ones. And the gray points are observations. And the colored points are the results of these simulations. So the simulations I showed you are 2D, but they're confirming that their stars explode in 3D as well. So it's not a fine tuning of that shock collision thing. Okay, and the typical masses that they need to produce this range of ejecta is from 0.85 to 1.1 solar masses. So you do not have to be at a Chandrasekhar mass um, to explode uh, a white dwarf. And that was completely new to me. Um, no, no, sorry. Um, that was completely new to me. And something has qualitatively changed in the simulations in the last five years. Um, and when I started digging into this, I discovered that the kind of key development they made uh, was to greatly improve their nuclear reaction network. And so when before they had to have some unrealistic white dwarfs with a thick helium shell, blah, blah, blah. Now they can explode things much more easily, hopefully also much more realistically. And then another thing that's happening is that they have a much better radiative transfer. This is happening across all areas of numerical astrophysics. And so they produce a remarkably good match with observed late time spectra. I mean, it's kind of eerie. Um, so there are some remaining issues. There is this little bit, bit of magic that happens at the detonation of helium shell, one small bit remaining to explain. Um, and then there's also some orientation effects. So this is the mass sequence, but when you look at this object, it's not spherically symmetric because the explosion here was not spherically symmetric. And so it turns out that the orientation effects produce a spread in the Phillips relation. So that also needs to be ironed out to determine how much of the spread is realistic and how much is not. But nonetheless, it does appear that sub chandra sector explosions are the best type 1A candidates. So if we find these uh, more massive, but not necessarily super chandra sector pairs, that may be the solution to the type 1A um, to the type 1A problem. In terms of rates, I'm not going to go into the details um, of that, um, but the conclusion is that there, um, there are some discrepancies between different models, different observations, and then there are some phenomenological models that try to tie off all observational evidence together. And the conclusion is that white dwarf merger rate in the Milky Way is uh, five to seven times greater than type 1A rate. So in principle, there's enough. But right now, 
free as DSS-5, there is no handle on the mass distribution. So that's the key missing piece right now. The rates may be sufficient, but within this number, it is not known how many objects will be in this regime where they can do this. So that's what we're hoping to solve with Sloan, uh, with this larger number of spectroscopically observed white dwarfs. We're hoping to find these pairs, which after they have shrunk enough due to gravitational wave mergers, so under 10 hours, um, that, that they will be that. That's what we're looking for. So the, that brings me to another very exciting point, which is that it, uh, it's, um, no, probably not. So there's a primary and a secondary. And in some models or in many models, this low mass object that was the donor to the higher mass object actually survives. And so this is the D6 scenario. And there are several candidates for these remnants. And we also actually have a paper on one of those remnants. I can talk about it to death. Um, so um, that's there, I know now we have a white dwarf flying out at a thousand kilometers per second, which is all kinds of weird. And that is, you know, low mass, you know, 0.2 solar masses. And yeah, so it's very, very suggestive. Um, so we, we found something interesting about that object too. Anyway, so I don't know when everybody got the memo that type 1As were sub Chandrasekhar explosions, but until I started working on that, I had no idea. So uh, that's an auto portrait uh, when I found out. Um, and in principle, the observed double degenerate population is sufficient to explain the rates. Um, this uh, channel might produce the remnants of the donor, and these may have been observed, and I can discuss that later. So what do we currently need? We need better statistics for higher mass system uh, and they're you know, improving the connection between these particular systems and the theory of detonation and with um, stellar population synthesis models. So uh, one last bit that I, so in my opinion, this question may be in sight. And then one last kind of tantalizing bit that I'm going to um, talk about is that binary white dwarfs are going to be strong Lisa sources. So if you ever see any of these papers, you will see plots like this. Um, this is the gravitational wave frequency. So this is much lower frequency than LIGO. Uh, and this is the four year sensitivity of Lisa. And this is the characteristic strain in this plot. So here were some of the known uh, double degenerates, uh, double degenerates. Here is our newly discovered object here, well detectable um, by Lisa. This is what Lisa group population synthesis model looks like. That is how many sources should be there. And so another mind blowing thing is that the sources we're discovering right now, I mean, are just the tip of the iceberg. There's, and they're really nearby, like. This object here is at like 26 parsecs, and it was discovered within the last couple of years. So there's clearly something like right in our backyard um, that has not been found and characterized yet. Um, so the stellar population synthesis models are predicting that there will be 40,000 uh, individual sources um, observable with LISA. Um, in the local group, there are a few dozen known, and we're still discovering new objects uh, within a hundred. Given your selection, so I, I, I cannot understand sort of what the issue is, right? Like I cannot understand what, where they're hiding. But one of the very unpleasant things about white dwarfs, which I think is kind of underappreciated, they're faint. <laughs> and if they are, you know, so, so they're faint to begin with. So it is actually expensive to even, right? So this was a Gemini observation to discover a relatively nearby object. And it required, you know, eight to 10 meter class observations to actually characterize this binary. So then Brown et al. confronted this exact, they spent massive amounts of observing time. They confronted this exact problem. What they, they are finding is that they do see these unseen companions with minimal mass above you know, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 solar masses, which could be very, very interesting if they're in the right period regime. 
um, but they cannot fully characterize these binaries because they don't see the companions. So they cannot break the degeneracy between the inclination and the mass. So those are the issue. I mean, they're not fundamental issues of our not understanding something. They're the limitations of observational resources and um, sort of the astrophysical limitation of uh, the fact that the more massive white dwarf is so faint. So no, there's no astrophysical major like discrepancy here. It's just for some reason, we're a bit behind <laughs> in terms of getting these sources, you know, and uh, characterizing them well. Let me just, uh, Nadia, if I could just chime in, I just want to say that, you know, SDSS-5 from the beginning was constructed in order to find systems like this because of the kind of horrific state that the sort of stellar astrophysics census was in relative, you know, think about cosmology and you think about the state that galaxies and galaxy formation is in, in, in no small part due to, you know, SDSS-1 and 2 and 3. Yeah. For, and and we aim to do a similar thing for stellar astrophysics. And I think that that I think your work is showing that that strategy is is paying off. And so I'm just so I'm actually tearing up watching your presentation because yes, because we should not have cut from 200,000 to 80,000. <laughs> hint, hint. <laughs> oh, that, but I also, as I put in the chat, we are going longer. So I got funding to extend the survey so that okay, <laughs> so that okay. we can get, so I got you covered, Nadia. And no, t t trust me, I don't. <laughs> Not any sources. <laughs> um, all right. Um, so I did not talk about, I didn't have time to talk about this, but um, this was my front slide. Um, this is NGC 2440, planetary nebula, a misnomer if we've ever seen one, right? So this is the ejected envelope um relieving behind so it's a single star evolution the star has recently evolved thrown off all of this stuff left behind this white dwarf i just want to advertise that shan chi and i are working on um dynamical probes of white dwarf mass loss in uh white white binaries so you can ask me about that um that's a very interesting project that i'm working on right now um uh, also related to white dwarfs but anyway so i i've come to my conclusion um, so in my group, we're interested in stellar binaries of all stages, young stellar objects to ultra compact binaries of remnants. So I've talked to you about the methods of measuring white dwarf atmospheric parameters. Uh, I've talked to you about the uh, mass radius relation and equation of state of white dwarfs um, through gravitational redshift. Uh, we are currently working very hard um, to search for binary white dwarfs. One discovered a couple dozen um, in the works. Um, these objects may be very important as possible type 1a progenitors. They do not have to be super Chandrasekhar, um, and they will be detectable low frequency gravitational sources. Um, these are very exciting um, data sets. I'm um, very interested in all of this, but uh, this is a bit overwhelming in terms of data. And of course, we're here less than a week <laughs> before Gaia DR3 release, which is uh, um, which is super exciting. Um, and I hope you all take greatest advantage possible of these incredible data sets. All right, thank you. Thanks for the great talk, Nadia. Uh, questions now, online or in the room? So I've got one, which is, I mean, these are coming from sort of solar mass progenitors which sort of half of solar mass stars are in binaries. So presumably half of the white dwarf or more are binaries, white dwarfs. Do you have an idea what that is? And then the next question is of your things that'll make it, you know, have 10 hour periods or whatever. That, that's presumably a much smaller fraction. What fraction of uh, white dwarfs are single versus these very short period ones or? Right, uh, okay, so that actually touches upon this project have not presented. So, uh, right, so there is, we have in our studies overall, we have sensitivity to very short period binaries where we can see uh, orbital evolution, not orbital, or orbital motion on the uh, time scale of observations. And we have actually sensitivity to very long period binaries, the white binaries that are co-moving in the plane of the sky. So I can tell you about the fraction of binaries for the white binaries. 
uh, it is um, lower than the main sequence, main sequence binary fraction. This is the word, this is exactly the work in preparation here. Um, some of them get disrupted essentially due to the mass loss, um, so the orbital evolution due to the mass loss of the more massive star as, as it becomes a white dwarf, exactly this process. Um, but otherwise, it's very consistent with the population being derived from the main sequence, main sequence white binary population that we see. We have very little handle on any sort of intermediate kinds of periods, uh, right, where the radial velocities don't evolve on um, uh, timescales that are short enough where we can take multiple, well, it's not even easy to sort of identify candidates for follow-up, right? Like you see a white dwarf, um, if it's at a, you know, one AU separation from a neutron star or something, you will, you know, you will not know about this uh, from a survey like Sloan, for example, you have a multi-year, you have to have a multi-year strategy to measure those things. Gaia potentially can find some interesting sources in these intermediate separation regimes. Um, so Gaia is actually planning to look for these dark companions to brighter objects using astrometry, and that's exactly the types of data, rele data being released in DR3 that we are Super excited about. I don't know what, if anything, I have the brain space for in terms of this analysis. So, on the wide binary side, I can tell you it's consistent with your normal expectations. If they start with main sequence, main sequence configuration with your normal IMF um, and the initial to final mass transformation uh, expected from various works, everything is more or less consistent. There are small puzzles that I'm trying to resolve right now, but in, in this paper, but more or less everything is consistent. On these intermediate um, scales, I cannot tell you anything. And on the short time scales, this, the summary is basically, um, this, the state of the art is this. And all of those are products of this super, crazy looking scenarios. So that's the state of the art here. We are thinking about, so nobody knows. <laughs> We are thinking about this. We are thinking very deep thoughts. <laughs> uh, the spectrum I showed with the calcium was a normal star for comparison in terms of the wear absorption lines. Uh, I, I, I don't think that there was one. Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. So in, um, the, in the optical spectra, the fraction of white, so if you select DA white dwarfs, um, the fraction of those with detectable metal lines is very low. In order to get these high fractions that you're thinking, you either need to go to UV where the opacities of these elements are uh, much more significant, or um, if you actually stare very, very long with Keck at extremely high resolution of these spectra, you can sometimes see calcium and magnesium lines even in your vanillaest possible um, DAs in the optical, you know, you can see them. So um, that again, so the bottleneck here is either you have to have some sort of clever stacking analysis, which is what we're thinking, um, because we don't have access to, you know, eight, 10 meter class resources to sort of follow up, uh, follow up on a large statistical study, um, or you have to follow up a large number of objects and, uh, you know, sort of do it individually. The uh, ones that people tend to follow up with HST, for example, in the UV, um, so some of the original studies were just follow up of the objects with strong infrared disks, but no obvious optical companion, um, whatever that means. Um, but that's not enough to answer your question statistically. A few questions, Juna, you're up first. 
Unmute here. So thank you so much, Nadia, uh, for a beautiful talk and um, and just for just for just for digging this treasure out of these uh, even just this early spectra. It's it's so exciting to see what you and your group are doing, and and I'm so enthusiastic about it. And there was a comment that you made, which I think is quite interesting, um, about the fraction of supernovae that are um, you know this kind of shift in the community, the type one A community, going from uh, everything is single degenerate to everything is double degenerate. What is your, I mean, one of the advantages about uh, being uh, coming in from the extra galactic community is that you don't really have a dog in that fight. You can actually look at the empirical data with an objective kind of lens and it, it helps you see a little uh, cl more clearly. What is your sense of the status of, of those kind of discussions? And in particular within the double degenerate model, um, whether you think that they've really nailed it down with this particular, um, you know, Shen and Boos and, you know, oh, sure. yeah. Okay. So I, uh, when I first started working on this, I read the review paper by May Oz et al. 2014. It's an, a, 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 what is it? A, annual reviews of astronomy and astrophysics. And I emerged from this totally convinced that it's a double degenerate scenario. And they go through this incredible laundry list of all kinds of different observables. Um, I mean, some of them are um, just literally looking for the precursors to type 1As and nearby galaxies and going much deeper than, um, you know, uh, for any reasonable sort of main sequence progenitor. Um, the other ones are searching for uh, remnants, post-explosion remnants. Um, I, they have everything. I mean, it's a, it's a hundred page review article that in my opinion makes a very convincing case um, that um, double degenerate scenario dominates, although they do present several interesting unusual type 1As, which may be coming from um, the single degenerate scenarios that have some evidence for hydrogen at some stage of the remnants evolution, whatever. So in terms of the Shen et al model, um, this D6 scenario, so that is the scenario where the, there's a high mass white dwarf, there's a low mass donor, and the low mass donor donates some mass, the high mass and high mass one, then a little bit of magic happens to detonate this helium thing, that's the magic, magical bit in this model, then the more massive one explodes and the um, low mass one is flung out. So it looked like a very promising scenario essentially for everything, but the counts are not quite working out. So they were very enthusiastic with the first Gaia data release to look for uh, extremely high proper motion objects because these objects are ejected with orbital velocity basically at the time of the explosion, which is very, very, very close. And so you expect 1,000 1, kilometer per second kind of velocities. Those are really easy to find in Gaia. And um, they found three, and they found none since then. And at this point, it's a little bit of intention with being able to explain everything. So I, again, this is not my work. I don't know the gory details of this. But they expected uh, five to 10 times more based on the reasonable type 1A rates and how long such uh, remnant would be visible in the, in the galaxy. And so there are, you know, there are many complications to this story. There are various observational biases. They did try to take all of this into account. In my opinion, there is still tension. So it's uh, right now, these three objects that they have found are not consistent with all type 1As being from that scenario. So it's a, another sort of interesting puzzle. To Dick and then Peter. Hi. Uh, like Juna, I was uh, tearing over your presentation, but for rather different reasons. Uh, the very first thing I worked on at Caltech before I uh, went off into the cosmos was white dwarf cooling, which is a great, <laughs> great subject. But along the way, as we thought more and more about white dwarfs and merging, the dominant word became off-center ignition so that people were envisaging a perturbation in the uh, nuclear uh, uh, 
species that would cause an off-center detonation, which would ultimately cause, yes, the center to blow up. It seems to me that the current thing that is being referred to, but in a good way, is in fact exactly that process, except that the perturbed region is in fact a nonlinearly perturbed large fluctuation in terms of what you might call the primary white dwarf, that is to say where the explosion initiates. That's a long-winded way of uh, getting around to what I was really going to point out. If that is true, then as you vary the uh, binary issues that are associated with the primary white dwarf, you will get a spectrum of activities. And in particular, you can see that within the uh, exploding white dwarf itself. So then you might ask, who says these are good standard candles? And if they are, presumably, and this model holds, we would have to fully understand these nonlinear perturbations and, uh, and try and make a, a, a concerted model of it. Anyway, so that's my uh, enjoyment of the fact that it seems the double detonation model is all de rigueur these days. Um, I'll just make one very brief comment. So this is a, you know, this is definitely a sort of key thing that they are ironing out. So again, this is not my work. This is Ken Shen's work um, and um, Townsley and Booth and collaborators. And so they are ironing this out. Um, this does require very sophisticated uh, radiative transfer to sort of predict exactly what the observer would see along all these different orientations. And as I said, the different orientations are in are contributing to the scatter in this diagram. And so um, one very interesting possibility is if these if these simulations ever get to the point of actually, so qualitatively, they look beautiful. I didn't put any spectra, but I look at their simulated late time spectra and the type 1a spectra, I don't see a difference. They see, you know, they can predict the velocities of these absorption troughs of these intermediate metallicity elements. It's really, really beautiful. Um, one interesting possibility is that with much better late time spectra, is it possible that the models can actually place a constraint on the orientation of the observer relative to whatever the explosion axis? And if so, can we actually use late time spectroscopy to then shrink to provide an additional sort of calibration to the Phillips relation to sort of shrink the um, scatter in this relationship even further? So that is definitely, yeah. but, but that's, I'm not involved in this. I'm just telling you what I but learned. That's, at the, yeah. The, but that's just great. I mean, that's a really uh, astounding direction for this to go in. Um, so just to throw another element in, uh, particles are released in white dwarf cooling. And those particles have been used, well, the data has been used to place constraints on the type of particles that can have been released. And uh, it seems to me this is yet another system to be able to do that very uh, powerfully. It's very interesting. Yeah. Okay, last question to Peter. Hi, Nadia, thanks for your great talk. Uh, I was just curious about uh, whether your group was thinking back earlier in the evolutionary past to these amazing objects to try to integrate uh, physically, statistically to populations of cataclysmic variables and novi. Um, yeah, so I, uh, we have a project on a cataclysmic variable that is very mysterious. So uh, I am a complete novice with all of those things, I'm very interested. We are kind of human resources starved, um, but we have this one very mysterious cataclysmic variable, uh, which is at the sort of minimal predicted period for cataclysmic variables that's doing very interesting things, has some unexplained emission properties, or maybe for people who work on cataclysmic variables, it's completely vanilla and 
uh, obvious, but I, um, it, it's, a, it's a puzzling object. But that's as far as we have gone in this direction so far. I can tell you that other groups in Sloan are actively cataloging and categorizing cataclysmic variables. And it is similarly possible because the cataclysmic variables have periods that are also kind of commensurate with about one hour type of periods. It is actually possible to derive orbital period distribution of cataclysmic variables from Sloan data. So this is a, again, this is not us. Um, this is a group uh, led by uh, Boris Genzike and his uh, um, graduate student Keith Inite, and so there will be a big catalog paper from Sloan 5 on cataclysmic variables, including some previously known and some newly discovered. But no, I have not tried to do this exercise um, just because, you know, we are, <laughs> we're just getting going. I don't know much about this, and uh, that's, you know, that's sort of where we're at, but it's an interesting question for sure. Does the surface detonation that causes a nova have anything to do with this double detonation model, or is it completely different? It, it obviously fails to cause a supernova, but cause, it produces a pretty nice phenomenon, the nova. Right. Um, Maybe the core is too, not, not massive enough or something. I, well, I don't know. Yeah, it's definitely um, sort of a lower mass, uh, lower mass regime. But the so what I don't know, um, is another interesting question, but that's, it's a great question. I'm definitely going to look into this. Is how much energy is released in these? Uh, no, I mean Nova is a very well studied phenomenon. So there's presumably an energy distribution of these flares, and one can track down at sort of what orbital stage. Uh, uh, at what orbital stage and what kind of energies are released in these individual explosions and compare that to what they need in these um, double degenerate scenarios to uh, get their thing going. So I don't know the answer to this question. It's quite possible that there is a large range between these two values, but I just don't know. Yeah, yeah there's even interesting recurrent novi. So yeah. you know, there's a lot of things for you to uh, look at. Great, thank you very much. So I do want to say one thing, which is that the um, sort of steady state accretion onto white dwarfs has long been kind of ruled out as the um, source of this extra mass that the white dwarf needs to accrete in order to become a type 1a. And that's because the accretion events are all associated with ejection events. And so most or all of their or even more <laughs> of the mass is actually thrown off. So that's why it's very difficult yeah, yeah. to get to a high enough mass uh, by um, sort of steady accretion. And that, that is, you know, another thing that people are ruling out with current observations. Yeah, yeah, I agree totally with that. Thank you. So since we're past the hour here, let's officially end the seminar now. Thank you, Nadia, for a very interesting talk. And if there are a few more questions on that, maybe uh, Nadia, you can stick around yep. for a or two. Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Um, Everyone, see you next time.